Hi, I'm Pastor Steve Putty Marshall. Welcome to the Atascadero United Methodist Church. We have some gathering music first, and so we invite you to relax and listen to that, and then we'll start worship. You're invited to make sure you're wearing something pink today because it's Joy Sunday, the third Sunday of Advent.
Hi, I'm Pastor Steve Potit Marshall. Once again, welcome to worship today. Please uh, go to our worship hub for all our announcements and any pertinent information you might need to know about the church. It's located there. And today, of course, is Advent. And so we invite you to have your Advent candle ready to light at the very beginning of the service. Again, welcome to worship. Let's breathe and let's begin. This week, we turn to Luke's writing, which is an account in two acts, the gospel biography of Jesus and then the story of the early church, the Jesus community. Whether you were a Jew or Gentile in those days, deciding to become a part of this illegal early Christian movement could bring punishment for your allegiance. Surely the message in both Luke and Isaiah that the downcast, lowly, and oppressed would rise up as a welcome and inspirational account. Like the Jewish exiled people of Isaiah's time, and like the early Christians, we also sometimes wonder where God is in our suffering. We long to hear the promise that a reason for joyful praise is the good news on the way. I believe in God. I believe in God, even when, even when God is silent. I believe in God. I believe in God, even when, even when God is silent. The loneliness of fear. The loneliness of fear. The invisibility of the next step. The invisibility of the next step. The yearning for presence. The yearning for presence. I am Chris Parker Kennedy, and this is John. Please bow your heads in prayer. Holy One, we thank you for the glimpses we catch of your gift of the depths of joy. Even in the midst of fear, of challenge, of struggle, even when we are not sure of your presence, ignite the flame of joy within us. That we might glow with the brilliance from the inside out. I believe in God. I believe in God even when, even when God is silent. Help us face the silence of unknowing and embrace is that the present pause before joyful noon beginning. You are invited to light your Advent 3 candle of joy at this time. Mary was most wrong. 
Thank you for the, inviting me to children's time. This is Pooh's Christmas Gifts, one of my favorite all-time books. Pooh's Christmas Gifts by Isabel Gaines. Tomorrow is Christmas, said Kanga, and we're having a party, said Rue. So please come to our house at six o'clock, said Kanga. We want to celebrate with all of our friends. How fun, said Pooh. The next morning when Pooh woke up, it was dark outside. Oh my, he said, it must be six o'clock. I'm late for the party. Pooh hurried to Piglet's house. When he arrived, Pooh called out, Piglet, wake up, we're late for the party. Pooh and Piglet woke up their friends. Then they all headed over to Kanga and Roo's house. Merry Christmas, yelled Pooh. Oh dear, said Kanga, it's six o'clock in the morning. I'm at six o'clock tonight. Please come back later and then we'll start the party. Kanga Roo closed their door. What are we going to do until six o'clock tonight, asked Pooh. Let's make a snowman, said Piglet. They made three snowballs. Then they stacked them one on top of the other. When they finished, Tigger said, let's make snow angels. They each found a spot to lay down in the snow, and they began flapping their arms, legs, and wings. Poor Eero had trouble flapping his legs, so he just rolled around on his back. They all stood to admire their work. Everyone's angel was perfect, except for Eeyore's. His angel looked like a blob. I need to rest, said Eeyore. Just then, Christopher walk, Robin walked by. I have a gift for each of you, he said. Why, said Piglet. Because on Christmas, you give gifts to those you love, said Christopher Robin. We should give Christopher Robin a gift, said Rabbit. But what, asked Tigger. I have an idea, said Pooh. Christopher Robin, said Pooh, we built this snowman, and we would like for, to give it to you so you're never lonely. We made snow angels too, said Piglet. What would you like, to, would you like to have them as well? So you never get lost, said Pooh. I'm sorry, mine looks a little funny, added Eeyore. Thank you very much, said Christopher Robin. These are the best kinds of gifts because they come from the heart. Kanga and Rue are giving us a party, said Rabbit. What can we give them, asked Tigger. I know, said Al. Let's give them a song. Everyone agreed it was a great idea. Pooh started that song, and whenever he got stuck, somebody would add a word. Finally, they finished. They practiced the song until it was finally time for the party. Then they went back to Kanga and Roo's house and knocked on the door. When Kanga and Roo opened the door, all of the friends began to sing. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas, Kanga and Roo. 
It's love that we bring to share on this day. We wish you a Merry Christmas with this song. Hooray! That's the best gift ever, said Kanga. Please come and enjoy the party. And that's what all the friends did. This Christmas, think of the simple gifts, you guys. If you have time, maybe go sweep off some leaves off someone's driveway because we don't have snow here. If you have time, maybe make some Christmas cookies and give them to some friends it's just, just to say hi. But two of my favorite things to do are make Christmas cards. Just ask mom for some crayons and fold a piece of paper over and give it to a Christmas card, maybe someone in a nursing home. Or what else? Um, one of the things that my sister and I did, we would find a box and wrap it up with paper and not put anything in it. Then mom and dad would see it and they'd ask, what is that? And they said, that's our love for Jesus. It's inside that box. Just do something simple. Have fun. Merry Christmas. It will be said, survey, survey, build a road. Remove barriers from my people's road. The one who is high and lifted up, who lives forever, whose name is holy, says, I live on high in holiness and also with the crushed and the lowly, reviving the spirit of the lowly, reviving the heart of those who have been crushed. I won't always accuse, nor will I be enraged forever. It is in my own doing that their spirit is exhausted. I gave them breath. I was enraged about their illegal prophets. I struck them. In rage, I withdrew from them. Yet they went on wandering wherever they wanted. I have seen their ways, but I will heal them. I will guide them and reward them with comfort. And for those who mourn, I will create reason for praise, utter prosperity to those far and near, and I will heal them, says the Lord. The Magnificat is one of Christianity's oldest hymns that for nearly 2,000 years has been incorporated in the liturgy of the Christian worship, sung in hundreds of languages all around the world. Found in the first chapter of the Gospel of Luke, the Magnificat is the song that Mary sings in response to hearing that she will be giving birth to the Christ child. As she lifts her voice, she declares that through the life of her yet born child, God will show mercy and compassion for the lowliest among us. These words of Mary convey the mandate to all who seek to follow in the way of Jesus. We Christians are to resist the injustices of the world and at the same time pray for our enemies, welcome the stranger, and show love for our neighbors. Our anthem this morning is a contemporary setting of the Magnificat, composed by United Methodist singer-songwriter Jim Strathy. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has
Gospel according to Luke, chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, and 26 through 56. When Elizabeth was six months pregnant, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a city in Galilee, to a virgin who was engaged to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David's house. The virgin's name was Mary. When the angel came to her, he said, Rejoice, favored one, the Lord is with you. She was confused by these words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. The angel said, Don't be afraid, Mary. God is honoring you. Look, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of David, his father. He will rule over Jacob's house forever, and there will be no end to his kingdom. Then Mary said to the angel, How will this happen, since I haven't had sexual relations with a man? The angel replied, The Holy Spirit will come over you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the one who is to be born will be holy. He will be called God's son. Look, even in her old age, your relative Elizabeth has conceived a son. This woman who was labeled unable to conceive is now six months pregnant. Nothing is impossible for God. Then Mary said, I am the Lord's servant. Let it be with me just as you have said. Then the angel left her. Mary got up and hurried to a city in the Judean highlands. She entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. With a loud voice, she blurted out, God has blessed you above all women, and he has blessed the child you carry. Why do I have this honor that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. Happy is she who believed that the Lord would fulfill the promises he made to her. Mary said, With all my heart I glorify the Lord. In the depths of who I am I rejoice in God my Savior. He has looked with favor on the low status of his servant. Look, from now on, everyone will consider me highly favored, because the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. He shows mercy to everyone, from one generation to the next, 
who honors him as God. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered those with arrogant thoughts and proud inclinations. He has pulled the powerful down from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty-handed. He has come to the aid of his servant Israel, remembering his mercy, just as he promised to our ancestors, to Abraham and to Abraham's descendants forever. Mary stayed with Elizabeth about three months and then returned to her home. Thanks be to God for this holy word. So this past week, my father was able to go home after being in the hospital first and then being transferred over to rehab uh, for a total of three weeks of his stay. The good news is he's doing well and has made good progress so he could leave and go home. My sister and brother and I text every day. We check in and give progress reports, depending on who's talked to him last, how he sounded, and my sister gives us reports about what the therapist is saying, how he's building his strength up, and what needs to happen once he goes home. All this time, as I was focused on his progress, I was so grateful for the steps that he made towards recovery. And then my sister texted and said, I wonder if he, he, if he should get a COVID-19 test to be sure he did not contract it during his stay. And when she did that, when it hit my phone, it hit me in a wave of emotion, of, of panic and churning, and I wasn't sure what to feel about that. But I took a deep breath and calmly wrote a text back to my sister. The emotions, I believe, were about what I had been carrying inside, all my concern, my wonder, my, the unknown of how dad would be doing and how he would recover. I had grief for not being able to go and, and be with him during his surgery to repair the bleed in his brain. I had grief that I couldn't go and visit him even now for Christmas. I had panic about who may have spread the virus to him in that hospital. Now, as I hear of others in our community talk about their emotions and thoughts, both online and on phone calls and through emails, I see we are all grieving many things in this season of Advent. We have a, a wave of emotions that come over us. We are grieving perhaps the loss of being able to sing together, praying together, of celebrating together, and having to adapt to do more online. And sometimes we can't even do them at all. We put on a brave face for our children and grandchildren. We make alternative plans. We make the best of what we can. But I wonder, can we still experience joy on this joy, pink Sunday, or not? Now, as I re studied Mary's response, I note that in a few short sentences, the scripture records her initial response of being deeply troubled or confused or fearful, depending on how you translate that word, to being joyful enough to sing this wonderful song she sings. I want to know more about how she made that transition, because in, at this time, I'm feeling that sense of being deeply troubled, confused and fearful in unexpected moments that often reveal to me my unarticulated grief and my lament of the way life used to be. 
Once I realized I had all those feelings about my dad rumbling around in my soul, I tried to compare then my reaction to Mary's reaction when she hears the message that would cause her to experiencing troubling message emotions. I wonder, how did she find joy after initially being upset? The words of the messenger from God changed her and Elizabeth and Joseph, who all followed and all of those who ever had that experience of a message coming to them and troubling them. Some would have that experience after her as well. It's all recorded in the scriptures. But the message this time that Mary received is so powerful, so deep, so transformative, that she sings a song that moves us to this day. One so powerful, we are inspired by it. Now you have to note that Mary is not in church. I think that's important because I do love worship. I love to plan and offer worship. It's been my lifelong journey to do that well. I've trained in so many places to provide a worship experience for people to attend and for you to be inspired. I pray, however, in this moment that you find in worship what Mary found, a message from God. And what I mean by that is the worship that we are doing in our homes and online. I have to acknowledge that Sometimes God works in mysterious ways and brings us joy even outside of worship, being in this space together. And if I want to be honest, some of my most holy moments have come when I'm out in nature, when I'm hiking and talking with someone, or when I'm reading a book or talking on the phone, or when I'm writing in my journal. Someone's called this a variety of religious experiences. I have found, just like Mary did, that God can pop up anywhere at any time, which in itself is good news in this time when we worship in a different way. God can still bring us joy even when we are grieving, even when we're not meeting in the church building, when we are pulling out our hair because our house begins to feel like a prison, and our computers crash, and we miss with being with people so very, very much. I have a friend, Camilla, who is a single mom, raising two loving, amazing children. Camilla collects rocks that look like hearts. And I was glad that when I was over at the beach, I found a rock shaped like a heart. And I was excited to be able to send it to her, a gift from our family to hers. But when I got home, somehow the rock had broken in half. A broken heart. That sounds like how I feel so often these days. My heart breaks when I read the latest statistics of how many people have died and how many new cases of COVID-19 there are. My heart breaks when I think of those who will be missing, of those who will be missing those they love and have died this year. My heart breaks for the children who have had to adapt to online learning and who have not been able to participate in all the various activities in the same ways they have in the past. My heart breaks when I hear the anxiety and fears of people who are unsure about their future. Life can break our hearts with the losses we endure, the problems that can mount up like walls. When we feel at the end of our sanity and the created juices have been sucked dry, the good news is that, the, that God will help us find our balance again and that we will be transformed just as Mary was and experienced joy for God is the Lord of a brokenhearted people. 
From the beginning of time, people have faced tragedy and have grieved losses. And yet God sends a message of hope and healing in such a powerful way we experience comfort and joy. I realize my father going home brings me joy. My sister and brother who have stepped up to the plate and taken responsibility to make sure dad has everything he needs to thrive. I have joy in their uh, responsibility as my siblings. And I'm joyful that my dad and I can talk to get together even when he's in an isolated place. Never again will I underappreciate the gift of being together with my family, with you, with friends. And I will never miss another choir rehearsal if I can omit, avoid it. We all, I believe, have unarticulated grief in this time, a sigh too deep with words. Each of us are grieving. It could be the loss of your beloved husband or wife or grandmother or grandfather, the inability to gather together to honor their lives. It could be your children not being able to go to school and see their friends and playing together without worrying about social distancing or wearing masks. It could be you who is not sure of what the best decisions are. Do you travel to visit family or not? Which things can you do safely and which things are to avoid? And wouldn't it be, and, and I wonder if you asked the question about those things that we used to say that started with something like, it wouldn't be Christmas if we didn't. The truth is Christmas is all about celebrating the birth of Jesus into the world who came as an infant, humble and vulnerable to the pain of life and then grew into a man who gives our troubled souls relief, our lives meaning and calls to us love one another as God loves us. This is at the root of Mary's joy, I believe. She came to recognize in the midst of her bewilderment that God is a God of comfort and joy. God comforts our troubled, grieving, anxious, tearing out the hair of our head emotions and restores us to joy. I've noticed uh, as I've been watching some of the Christmas movies that are coming out this time of year, that there's a thread of uh, a particular theme that you see in each one of them. It is about believing. Believe in Christmas. Believe in Santa. Believe in love. Believe in miracles. Believe in music. And since our theme is about believing, I realize just how important belief is in our faith. Our, of believing in a God who can redeem our grief and turn it into joy. A God of a brokenhearted people. Sometimes it's hard to do that. That is to move into the future and experience joy especially in these uncertain times. We want certainty, we want order, we want it to happen the way we want it to happen. But believing in something means sometimes, but we believe it even when it does not go the way we want it to do. Believing when it is risky to do so, and we may fall flat on our face. Believing even though we cannot feel or see or touch what we believe in, it is just as real to us as it was to Mary. As for me, I believe in the joy of Mary. As she sings, with all my heart, I glorify the Lord. In the depths of who I am, I rejoice in God my Savior. That is at the root of Mary's joy which is available to all of us at this time of year. May you experience this joy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
I invite you to get into a comfortable position of rest. I invite you to get as quiet and as still as you can. I invite you to take a deep breath and get into a deep listening posture, perhaps eyes closed or fixed on a candle as we prepare for a time of prayer. Let's join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Hi, good morning. This is Pastor Steve with today's Mission Moment. Today's Mission Moment is focusing on our work as the Atascadero United Methodist Church. We are uh, doing well this year in completing our commitments to uh, missionaries overseas um, for the missions here in our own uh, town. Uh, to serve our children and our youth and our adults and to continue uh, providing you great worship experiences online. And so we're grateful for that. As we move now towards the end of the year, we need your giving even more uh, before we end this year because we are not able to take an offering up in person as we might usually do but we are looking closely at our budget and what we need for the end of the year. And it's important for you to see that we need a little bit more uh, so that we can end the year in a very positive financial situation. So if you can give a special Christmas gift, uh, a blessing to the world and to this community, we hope you'll prayerfully consider that as well in this time. And then also we wanted to remind you that it's not too late to pledge for next year. We have received about 75% of what we were expecting uh, for next year. And we made a budget kind of built on that expectation. And so if we don't receive um, those 25% more uh, pledges, they'll be having, we'll have to make major decisions about our staff and our budget uh, in the coming year. And I know that you appreciate the staff, and I know you appreciate what we do as a church. And so if you haven't pledged already, please do so, so we can know what we have to work with uh, in the coming year. Again, you've been so generous in, in making the effort to, to bring in your pledges and your giving to the office or sending in them through a check or using our new system of Venmo. And that has been so helpful. But we need your uh, attention to this and so that we can continue the mission of our church in the coming year. Again, thank you so much and God bless. My name is Richard Smith. 
Mary sings, He has filled the hungry with good things when celebrating the joy of being the mother of Jesus. May we all fill the hungry with good things and lift up the lowly, not just with our offerings and tithes, but with our whole lives. Today let us give with joy to the work of Jesus and his church. Gracious and generous God, we offer our gifts to you, knowing full well that we have devoted so much more energy into finding the gifts for our families and much less on the gifts we offer to you. You gave Mary, an unmarried girl, a son so the world might have a savior. Her response was so simple, here I am, the servant of the Lord, let it be according to your word. May her affirmation of faith and obedience be the gift we offer this day. In Christ we pray. Amen. The familiar joyful, joyful, we adore thee is also known as the Ode to Joy, and it's one of the best known hymns in the English language. Henry Van Dyke wrote the poem in 1907 in response to the beauty of the Berkshire Mountains where he was serving as a guest preacher. The hymn begins by developing the metaphor of light as the antithesis of darkness and the joy that light brings to our world. Flowers open to the sun above, clouds of sin and sadness melt. Dark and doubt are driven away as the giver of immortal gladness fill us with the light of day. It seems obvious that such an upbeat and cheery view of the world was intended to counter the increasing threat of the bleak days prior to World War I. Having served as a military chaplain, Van Dyke knew the wages of war. But in the final verse of his cheery, all is right with the world ode to joy, he supports the belief that even in the most difficult of times, ultimately, humanity is progressing. Ever singing, march we onward, victors in the midst of strife. And then in the final line, he writes, giver of immortal gladness, Fill us with the light of day. Ode to Joy.
You are invited to pick up this week's candle and prepare to take it to reside in the wreath. Hold it high for the benediction. We wait for justice, but we do not wait to work for change. We wait for restored health, but we do not work, wait to work to heal. We wait for wholeness, but we do not wait to work at binding brokenness. We wait for peace, but we do not wait to work to eliminate hatred. And so my friends, like bells ringing out the news that God is ever present with us, fill the night left by sadness with messages of joy. Go into your lives humming the tunes that keep the joy alive in you and that spur you on in your work of justice and reconciliation. Raise your voices and repeat after me, do not be afraid. Amen. Again, thank you for joining us for worship. It's time for fellowship. And so we, on your, you'll have a link here for you just to tap on and you'll join us for that. Come and discuss the service or any thoughts you might have, any things that are on your mind. Come on over for fellowship.